But if you, if you grab your Bibles, uh, Hebrews is where I want you to turn today. Uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 12 is where we're going to be at. And today we are in part four of a collection of talks entitled Single and Secure. And if you haven't heard, uh, three weeks ago I released my third book. It's entitled Single and Secure, Breaking Up with the Lies, Falling in Love with the Truth. And uh, maybe you're here in person today. We've got a whole bunch of these that you can purchase a copy, get one of these, give it to a friend. But even those of you that are watching online by way of YouTube or listening to the podcast, you can go to intothenight.com and you can get yourself a physical copy. Uh, I even, uh, we even have an audible out there. So if you're like, I don't like, I don't like reading, I'll read to you, okay? And uh, we want to get this into your hands. And what we've been saying the last few weeks is that this book and this collection is so much broader than just for single people. We're talking really all things about relationships, but we're talking about finding contentment, security, confidence in whatever season of life that you are in. And I've learned uh, in 15 years of marriage that most relationship problems actually boil down to individual issues. And so we have to continue to work on the individual before marriage, in marriage. Some of you are going through a divorce or have been divorced after marriage. Uh, I really believe that you're born an individual, you die an individual, one day you stand before God as an individual. And you need to make sure that Jesus is the one who completes you. Jesus is the one who brings contentment to your life. And so uh, I think this project will help you do that. And today we are picking up uh, part four of this collection. We have been talking about all sorts of things, but uh, I think today, uh, I've had it on my calendar for a while, that today I really believe is a great uh, day of healing at Vu Church that a whole lot of people, their their hearts are gonna heal. And I wanna just read one passage. I got a lot of Bible verses and I also have a whole lot of content today I wanna share with you. So I'm gonna move quickly through it. And uh, there's a whole lot more about this in the book, but Hebrews chapter 12, 12, verse 15, this is what the writer says. He says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. What a fascinating choice of words. Grace is there, don't miss it. You gotta receive it. Don't miss the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Don't let a bitter root grow up inside of you. Don't miss the grace of God. Uh, Today, I wanna take the next few moments, part four of our collection, Single and Secure. I wanna teach today on heartache and heartbreak. Heartache and heartbreak. Thank you so much, Fed, you're amazing. Really, the passage that we are, are, are looking at today has been a passage that has really impacted my personal life in so many ways. Um, because what I have discovered uh, about a lot of people is a lot of people are not living single and secure. A lot of people are living uh, single and bitter. And let's just not, you know, let's come for everybody. I know a lot of people that are not married and secure, married and bitter. N- not divorced and secure, divorced and Bitter. <laughs> bitterness is um, such a big deal because bitterness will rob you of every great blessing that God has in front of you. If you don't deal with bitterness in your heart, I don't care how good the relationship is, you will eventually destroy it. And today, the writer is talking about a root of bitterness, but how many know before you get to a root of bitterness, you have to have a seed of bitterness? Where does bitterness begin? Most of the time, bitterness starts in the form of what we call the word offense. And what happens is, is that we live in 2022, and have you noticed that in 2022, everybody's offended with something? We're just offended. We're offended with people that we do know. We're offended with people that we don't know. Offended with my boss. Offended with my spouse. Offended with my kids. Uh, offended with the politicians. Offended, 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 offended. And what happens is, is that people on the journey, they get hurt. And then they don't deal with the hurt. And then the hurt begins to rob them of all the joy that God has in front of them. It's called a seed of bitterness. Some of us today, we are offended with someone and that person doesn't even know you're offended with them. Some of you, uh, you have an imaginary offense. (laughs) No one even did anything to you. You just think they did something to you. They looked at me wrong. They didn't know they looked at you. (laughs) And with it, 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 it's robbing us of confidence and contentment and it, it bleeds into every relationship. And we start to look at life through the lens of Bitterness, bitterness. A seed of bitterness usually begins with an offense, with a hurt 
But then the root of bitterness, it starts to form in the life of somebody who does not receive God's grace, who does not receive God's healing. And before you know it, it just begins to grow and grow and grow and grow. Now, whenever you start talking about bitterness, it's so easy to see other people's bitterness. It's hard for us to see our own bitterness. Every once in a while, you should just look at your neighbor and say, your bitterness is showing... That's something my wife would say to me. Rich, your bitterness is showing. Shut up, you know? (laughs) So easy to notice it in other people, hard for us to see it in ourselves. Bitter people are like clouds. When they disappear, everything is beautiful. (laughs) Because bitter people come around and they rob the beauty of the blessings. How many of y'all know we are much more blessed than we ever give God credit for? Anybody thankful today for a God who's who's good towards you? Um, This book, Single and Secure, was really formed out of a message that I preached in 2019 on the story of Ruth. And Ruth, to me, in the Bible, is like the quintessential, the picture of being single and secure. And I have an entire chapter dedicated to Ruth, and I don't have nearly enough time today to get all into her story, but I did want to highlight it for a moment because the story of Ruth is fascinating. Just four chapters in the Old Testament, but Ruth is the daughter-in-law of a woman by the name of Naomi. And Naomi and her husband Elimelech were Israelites who left Israel when there was a famine. They leave to an enemy territory known as Moab. And when they get to Moab, they have two sons, and these two sons end up marrying Moabite women. Uh, These Moabite women uh, join the family, but then during that time, what takes place is is both Elimelech and his two sons Uh, They all die, and Naomi is left with her two daughter-in-laws. One's name is Orpah, not to be confused with Oprah. And the other's name is Ruth, and now Naomi is alone with Ruth and Orpah, and she is now to take care of them. What I like about the story is that the story is not the story of one single woman. The story is about three single women. And all three single women deal with their circumstances much different. For what happens is, is that Naomi had left Israel because there was a famine in the nation and she went to Moab to try and find food. Now, what many people miss in the entire story is the context. The context is, is that Moab was an enemy territory. Naomi and Elimelech had no business going to Moab. And what happens so many times is is that we forget it is better to be hungry in the will of God than to be full outside of God's will. Because how many of you know, you can escape the famine, but you cannot escape death. They were operating outside of God's will and then they get there and calamity hits their home and destruction hits their home. And finally, after all of the men die, Naomi is saying, I'm gonna go back to Israel because the famine is over now and they're starting to have abundance. Let me go back. And she looks at her daughter-in-laws and says, don't come with me. There is no future for you in Israel. You stay back here. You don't belong with me. Orpah, AKA Oprah is like, okay, I'm gonna stay in Moab. But Ruth, who is single and secure says, no, I made a commitment. I am peculiar. I know my worth. I know my decision. I'm not going to believe the lie. I have encountered the one true living God through your son. And so my commitment is you, Naomi. I'm going with you wherever you go. Where you die, I will die. Your God will be my God. I am clinging to you. And Naomi's like, no, you stay. And you wonder, why is she pushing the girls to stay? Is it because her heart is so pure? Is it because she's so loving? Is it because she really doesn't believe that there's a future in Israel? Or is it because she's going back to her people and before she goes back to her tribe and her community, she wants to shed the evidence of where she has been? You ever backslide? You ever kind of get away from God and you're kind of sheepish coming back into community, kind of sheepish coming back towards God? Where you been? I don't want to talk about it. This is where Naomi's at. 
She's not giving this advice because of a good heart. She's giving this advice because she knows that she has been living in disobedience and she is not in a good place. How do I know? Because watch this. Ruth says, I'm not gonna do what you want me to do. In fact, I am not following you, Naomi, because of you. I'm following you because of the God in you and I know what's on the other side. So watch this, Ruth chapter one. I just wanna read this one verse. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? They haven't seen her in a long time. And what does she say? She says, don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara. Everyone say Mara. And if you got a Bible today, underline that in your Bible because I want to show you something at the end of the service today. Call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. It is one thing to get bitter. It is another thing to be bitter. I'm not just having a season of bitterness. I am now saying, call me bitter. This is my identity. How many of y'all know? You're never to trust your tongue when your heart is bitter. Because we say stupid stuff. And in Naomi's case, I just want to point this out. She's bitter. Why is she bitter? Because she stepped outside of God's will. She went to Moab. It didn't go the way that she planned. And now she's coming back like the prodigal, but it's not a repentant heart. It's not a remorseful heart. Instead, it's a bitter heart. Don't even call me by my Jewish name. Call me Mara, which literally means call me bitter. Call me bitter. Isn't it funny how some of us today, we are bitter, And we're blaming God for our bitterness. But yo, God didn't make you get into that broken relationship. God didn't make you lower your standard. God didn't make you throw off all of the warning signs when everyone was like, that's not a good decision. No, we've done that, but a bitter heart begins to blame God. And here's the thing for all of us that we've got to catch today. Bitterness is not going to get you what you want. (laughs) Bitterness is unattractive. I have yet to see anybody, when they list out the qualities they are looking for a partner, put at the top of the list, get me somebody bitter. (laughs) I want tall, dark, and bitter. (laughs) No! It is pushing away the blessing of God. It is pushing away the partner that God has brought you. It is pushing away your children. Bitterness pushes away God's blessing. And many of us today, if we're not careful, a root of bitterness will come in and it will defile us and everything around us. And I'm talking about it today because bitterness shows up in so many relationships and bitterness shows up in seasons when it gets difficult and when it gets hard. And sometimes the season is not even our fault, but sometimes the season is our fault. But it's hard for us to take responsibility because it's so much easier to blame someone else and to live offended. But all the while I live offended, whether that's with you or with God, my life is not getting bigger. It's getting more and more bitter. So what are the seeds of bitterness? We can talk about a lot of different things, but I want to just give two frameworks today of how bitterness will begin to seep into our hearts. The first is this idea of the word heartache. Everyone say heartache. heartache. That bitterness begins in so many people's lives through a moment uh, 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 of heartache and heartache the way that I'm describing it and using it today is, is really not about having something and losing it. Heartache is more about a longing for something that you've never gotten. And when I look at relationships in particular, when I look at people, what's robbing them from security, contentment, and confidence in the season of life that they are in, one of the greatest forms of heartache that I actually believe is in all of humanity comes from the longing and the desire for a relationship with our Father. And many of us, we don't even know it, but we have what I call a father wound. Culture would call it daddy issues, but sometimes we'll use that as a negative connotation towards a certain category of people. But in all reality, I think every one of us have some form of a daddy 
issue, a father wound, that there was a longing that was put in me in the soul level for relationship, for belonging, for affirmation from my biological father. What is the father wound? It's an area of your life where there was an absence or a neglect or abuse or a withholding of what you were longing for from your earthly father. And many of us, we don't realize it, but it's created a heartache that is bleeding into all of our other relationships. And at the core of it, the bitterness is I never got what was put innately in me. I never found that fulfillment. There's all sorts of different types of dads out there. I heard a pastor talking about the different types of dads, but let's just, for a moment, I know this is some heavy stuff, but we actually have to confront it before we can ever find healing in it. Different types of dads out there. In fact, there's five different types of dads. The first type of dad is the tragic dad. And some of you, even in this room today, this is what you experience. A tragic dad is that your dad just wasn't there at all. For whatever reason that was, maybe it was death. (laughs) Maybe your dad died prematurely. And although you have maybe fond memories of him or maybe your parents told you beautiful things about your dad, he just wasn't there. And it's, it's tragic and it's left this wound that many times you go searching for it in other relationships because your dad was, he was tragic. He's not bad, it's just, it's tragic. The second type of dad is just what I call the terrible dad. Just terrible dad. Like, like your dad, I'm not gonna make you raise your hand, but he was just terrible. Maybe he was an alcoholic and maybe you watched that and you learned those behaviors or maybe you watched him verbally abuse your mom or maybe he was just, you know, he, he brought you into this world but he was never ever around. He's just a terrible dad. Maybe your dad was tough. I'm not gonna, once again, make you raise your hand. Maybe he had a tough dad. Just, you know the tough dad, just always on you. Never enough, just you don't measure up, you're not good enough, you're not strong enough. You can usually find these guys on the sidelines of a Little League game losing their mind. <laughs> Just tough. Maybe your dad was, uh, was tender, which is like the kind dad, like just sweet, kind but, but, but soft, and d- d- didn't teach you convictions, didn't teach you how to stand up for yourself, didn't put value on you, was nice, was sweet, but really didn't put any type of strength into your soul. Or maybe the last one is a terrific dad. I gotta be honest with you, this is, this is, I have a terrific dad. My dad is an amazing man of God, been married to the same woman, praise God, for 40 plus years, raised four sons, one of which was uh, mentally challenged, handicapped, disabled, all four sons, not perfect by any means, uh, but all serving the Lord, all building the church of Jesus Christ. We all have a relationship today. We can actually sit at the dinner table and not fight physically. Um, <laughs> I have a terrific dad. I don't know what type of dad you have, but what I know is is whether they were tragic, terrible, tough, tender, or even terrific, your earthly father cannot measure up to your heavenly father. And here's what I've learned. I've learned that your view of God is often a projection or rejection of your earthly father. We don't know it, but all of us, we're either projecting upon our heavenly father or rejecting something about him, all based upon the dad we had in this life. And the idea is that if I don't actually begin to deal with my father wounds, if I don't actually get it out into the open, before you know it, I paint a poor view of who God is. We are living in very, very interesting days where more than half the kids that are being born into our nation in many ways are are at this point growing up without a father figure in the home. This is really important that you see this because I think so often relationships are bitter because there is a heartache that is never ever addressed. And so they go through life and there's this longing, there's this desire and they don't know what it is. And so we go seeking for it in somebody else. We go seeking it for in a husband or, or a wife, but they cannot measure up. Malachi chapter four, this was written hundreds of years before Jesus came. This is the last Old Testament prophet. John the Baptist really is the last Old Testament prophet, but this is the last Old Testament book that we have. And then after Malachi, it's like 300 years before God speaks again. This is the last thing written in Malachi. I want you to see this. See, I will send the prophet Elijah. Prophet Elijah, we know that John the Baptist is the last Elijah. The prophet Elijah, so I'm gonna send John the Baptist before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will watch turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. 
in many ways, I think that we are living in some cursed days culturally with so much brokenness, dissension, and division between fathers and their children. This is one of the reasons why we gather in God's house, that we are reminded that John the Baptist was sent to prepare the way for Jesus, and Jesus actually came to bless the land by turning the hearts of the father to their sons and the sons back to their fathers because the earthly father was always supposed to give us a glimpse of a heavenly father, but we were always supposed to know that only our heavenly father can heal our wound. Only our heavenly father can heal our wound. And so Jesus shows up on the scene. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 18, this is just good news for everyone. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. An orphan spirit shows up in so many people because they start to live their life with this father wound. And the father wound leaves us in a place that I'm unworthy. I don't measure up. Nobody loves me. I, I, I discount myself. I give myself to anybody who's available. And it's all because I have forgotten that Jesus came to turn our hearts to the Father. That Jesus says, I'm not gonna leave you. Maybe your dad was terrible. Maybe he was tragic. Maybe he was even terrific, but he didn't, doesn't measure up to God. I wanna let you know that I have come to meet you right where you are. John chapter 14, this is what Jesus says. He says, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Watch this. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. It's amazing because in churches, a lot of times we talk about the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about Jesus. Our church talks a lot about Jesus. But have you ever noticed that we don't talk a lot about the Father? Father, at times, part of the Godhead, he, he gets left out. The Holy Spirit leads you to Jesus, but Jesus brings you to the Father. And what so many of us don't realize is so often our Father wound is creating a separation between us and God because we continue to project upon God. God, why did you let that happen to me? You must just be like my earthly dad. But we've got the analogy flipped around because we're not supposed to see God through our earthly father. We're supposed to see our earthly father through the lens of God, that God, you are perfect, you are just, you are gracious, you have never left me, you have never forsaken me, you welcome me home like the prodigal. He says, come home, I'm waiting for you. When Jesus teaches us how to pray, he teaches us to pray, Abba, Father. He wants you to have a relationship with God. The idea of prayer is not about points. It's not about information. It's not about knowing all this stuff. The whole point of prayer is that you would relate to God like your dad. You talk to him like your dad. The truth of the matter is, is that so many of us, we're gonna have to learn that we have to take the journey from the son to the father. Because the son forgives you of your sin, but it's the, only the father who can heal you of the brokenness of your sin. This is why there's many people living today that are forgiven and going to heaven, but they still live broken here on this earth because they stop at the son and they don't let the son bring him to the father. Jesus is saying, if you've seen me, you've actually seen my dad and my dad is your father and he is good and he wants to heal your heartache. Maybe you didn't have it in this life, but you are never gonna find it in a partner. You are never gonna find it in more kids. You're never gonna find it in that status, that title. All that money is not gonna bring you the affirmation that you're looking for. You've gotta find it in the gospel. You've gotta find it in a God who says, I am with you, I believe in you, and I love you. So a lot of us, we have this thing called heartache, this longing that comes back to a father wound that bleeds into bitterness, and then the bitterness robs us of the blessing that God has for us right now. But maybe, just maybe, maybe you, you learn to, to find fulfillment in the Father, which is what the whole book is about, the heartache begins to be mended, but as my heartache goes away, as I find completion in Christ, I still can't escape at times, I'm gonna deal with this idea of heartbreak. 
And the difference for me is heartache is a longing for something that I do not have. Heartbreak, on the other hand, is something that happens to me. Heartbreak is about having something and then it being taken from me. Case in point, the story of Naomi and Ruth. That Naomi at one point had a husband, had two sons, and then everything is taken. Her heart is broken. And, and, and many of us are here today, and as we get into relationships, some of us, we don't even come to church for these four weeks. It's like, I don't wanna, you have no idea, Rich, all that I've lost. You have no idea all of the pain. You have no idea of all the trauma I have gone through. This person hurt me. This person wounded me. And it's sensitive stuff. Like, it's heavy stuff. It, it's, it's stuff that hurts us. And many of us, we're dealing with a broken heart. And our broken heart if it is not addressed and if it's not attained to, what happens is that bitterness creeps in and it starts to defile us, according to Hebrews, and defiles everyone around us. And here's what I know. I know that God can heal your broken heart, but you need to give him all the pieces. What does that mean? That means that you have to get honest before him and you have to receive this grace that he has for you right now, this hour, in this moment. It's amazing. Um, the word broken heart is actually invented by the Bible. 1,000 BC, the first time this phrase has ever shown up and it's through the Bible. And so we all say, I'm heartbroken, broken heart. It's funny how atheists, we use that term. It's like, you're quoting the Bible. But anyways, um, <laughs> Psalm 34, 18, watch this. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. I just love that, that once again, my heartache is solved through relationship, through Jesus to the Father. He begins to heal it. And then when my heart is broken through this earth and through this life, my God comes in and he's close to the broken areas. Look at this, Psalm 147.3. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Now, just practically, we read that. It's like, what does that mean? The idea of binding something, for us, the word that we would know is the word cast. That if my arm breaks... How many know they have to put plaster around it and they have to set it in a stable position with restriction so that it can begin to heal properly? When our heart is broken, we serve a God who comes and puts a cast around it. He begins to restrict some things, but he sets it in the right posture and position so that healing and restoration can take place in our life. Okay, well, Rich, how do I, how do I deal with this, this pain? How do I deal with this breakup? How do I deal with this divorce? How do I deal with this person that left me or hurt me? How do I deal with my broken heart? Well, I got to give God all the pieces. Well, how, how do I do that? Well, he's going to bind it. This is what you got to do. This is just really simple. The first thing you have to do is you have to stop denying the pain. Like, I don't know what this is, but like we go through life, especially when it comes to relationships. It's like, I'm good. We think it's cool to act like that thing didn't hurt us. We think it's cool to act like we are already on the other side of it. What's amazing about a broken heart is that, once again, we the individual have a hard time seeing it, but everyone around us so often can see the thing that's creeping out. It's like having a broken arm. Imagine my, my, the bone was sticking out of my arm, and it's like, I'm good. You're like, no, you're not, you know? Your arm is really broken. <laughs> Let's do something. No, I'm good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, after church, after church, I'll get to that. No, dude, like, you're not gonna make it. It's funny that we just keep denying the pain Listen, pain is always a warning sign from God. I was listening to a psychologist teach not too long ago, and he was talking about the pain of a breakup or the pain of relationship loss. He said, as you study the brain, what you'll discover about the brain is in the same way when there is relationship loss, it is the exact same brain activity as an addict when they are fiending for a drug. M meaning... When someone leaves my life that I was committed to, that I was invested in, when death happens, when loss happens, when breakups happen, when I'm betrayed, when I am rejected, we don't know it, but literally our brain is reacting in the same way as an addict who's having a withdrawal. I'm bringing that up because... We could all teach today or say some good things to someone who's addicted to something, who's dealing with withdrawals, but we don't look at heartbreak the same way as we look at addicts with withdrawals, but it's the same brain activity. 
We, we can't deny the pain. We have to acknowledge that we're hurting. We have to acknowledge that we're broken. We have to acknowledge that, man, we need some help. Talk to a friend. Get with a pastor. Go to your crew leader. Get therapy. Get a counselor. Don't deal with it on your own. Here's a sure way to stay broken. Try to treat yourself. I'm going to work on my heart. It's not that bad. It's bad. And it's okay that it's bad. So it's okay that at times something breaks us, but it's not okay when the breaking turns to bitterness. So you have to stop denying the pain, but watch this. This is going to help some people. Now we're getting practical. You have to stop deifying your partner. This is, this is important because <laughs> now I'm just going to just teach some people because there's some people that are really dealing with a broken heart today and maybe you were the cause of it. Maybe you, you're not the cause of it. But what we tend to do is we tend to never get over something because have you ever noticed about yourself that you glorify the past? Like, I don't know why it is, but the past always seems so much like, wow. Oh, man. Whew. Yeah, like, right, right. Like, as soon as you quit that job that you've been hating forever and you start the new job the first week, you're like, oh, maybe the, maybe the old job wasn't so bad, you know? Like, and, 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 and this is what happens to people is that people live in this withdrawal state and they just live in the painful, broken state for too long and they don't bring closure to the relationship. And that's why it gets late at night and you, you text that person again or you find yourself going on Instagram, looking at all their pictures. How are they doing now? It's not healing your heart. You have to stop deifying your partner. I know, but that one night was amazing. We went to the fair and then we got on the Ferris wheel and he kissed me. Oh my God. I know, but your memory is lying to you. It's a half truth. You're forgetting the car ride home where you argued the entire way home. That person wasn't perfect and nor are you. I heard one psychologist talk about the idea that when you're actually going through a breakup and it's over, that you need to make a list about all the areas of how that person was not good for you. Because when the emotion comes on, when the feeling comes on, you tend to deify and glorify and go back to this rehearsal that is not true. You need to pull out your list and say, wait a minute, that wasn't good. They made me feel that way. That was never, ever gonna bring peace. That was not bringing satisfaction. I need the list in front of me. Because how do we get closure? It's important that you understand this in life. I did an entire collection of talks. You never heard it before. Go back and listen to the story we tell ourselves. You bring closure to a season by bringing meaning to the season. It doesn't have to mean something to me. It has to mean something to you. You have to tell yourself a story that actually brings closure, that I went through this because of that, or I faced that because of this. You've got to bring meaning to it in order for closure to happen, but you'll never find closure if you just live in this world where your partner is a God. They're not a God, and nor are you. I think this last one's important, is that you have to stop defying the process. Like, everyone knows that when you put a cast on your heart, on your bone, that there's, there's time that it takes place. And it's the same thing with a broken heart. Many of us, it's like our heart is broken, but we just want to jump back into something. We just want to get back into relationships. And there is a process to healing a broken heart. God, meet my heartache. I need the Father to heal me. I need to deal with my father wound, but then the trauma, the pain that I've dealt with from this heartbreak, it's gonna be a process. It, it takes some time. It's not an overnight fix. No one puts their arm in a cast and then takes it off the next day. We need restriction. Um, this Bible that I have, my dad gave it to me um, when I turned 18, it's his Bible. All throughout it are notes from my father that he wrote me for years and years. And uh, when I'm studying, there'll be, a, there'll be a note from my dad going, Rich, this is, apply this, do this. And um, when he gave it to me, the Bible was all beat up and it was falling apart. And so um, a couple of years ago, I had the Bible rebound. And today it looks almost, almost like a, a, a brand new Bible, but it's quite an old Bible. The Bible has been restored. Well, the only way for it to be restored is that it had to be rebound. And I just want to say, 
when God is restoring your heart, you don't need a rebound relationship. What you need to do is you need to be rebound to the cross, rebound to the spine, rebound to who Jesus is. Let, let the process happen. Because if not, bitterness is going to creep in. It doesn't matter how good that next relationship is. It's going to rob you of the blessing in front of you. Well, how do I know if my heart started to heal? There's lots of ways we could tell. I just wrote some down this week. Number one, uh, you know your heart started to heal when you don't need a relationship. You you want one. It's important. I don't don't need to to get back into something. I'm ready. I I would like a relationship. I I don't need a relationship. How about uh, you can see your mistakes, not just theirs? That's important. I didn't do everything right. I'm able to see that now. How about this? You can talk about the person with emotional control. (laughs) I don't know what your emotion of choice is. Some of you get real red and hot. Others of you get real teary-eyed and cry. Like a sign of healing is that I'm able to, whatever I can't talk about controls me. I'm able to talk about the pain. I'm able to talk about the wound. I'm able to talk about the trauma. I'm able to talk about the divorce. I'm able to talk about the betrayal. I'm able to talk about the affair. I'm able to talk about my part in it. Why? Because the scripture says that we overcome by what? By the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Watch this, number four. You can celebrate other people's happiness. This is a good sign. I I know like, hey, your bitterness is showing when you're like, that's never gonna work. That relationship will never work for him. I think you might be letting bitterness creep out when you can truly celebrate other people. I learned this on our journey when we were dealing with infertility. I talked to so many couples that are going through infertility, they're waiting on God and this heartbreak of not being able to bring life into the earth and it's, it's, it's clouding our vision. I'm looking through the lens with bitterness and it's hurtful and so I can't go to the baby shower and I can't, I can't go to the Christmas with my, with my siblings because they're all so happy and it just reminds me of how miserable I am. It's the sign of a broken heart. And it's not wrong to have a broken heart. It's just wrong that you don't do the work to get it healed because it will turn to bitterness and it will rob you of future blessings. That's why DC and I decided we're gonna be healed, bro. Like we're celebrating people. We're gonna be the best aunt and uncle. I pay off all my nephews and nieces. I'm writing checks every Christmas. Who's the best uncle now, you know? (laughs) Number five, I like this. You look forward to the future. Look forward to the future. The story of Ruth and Naomi is one that I've taught so many different times. But you gotta go read the story because Ruth, who's single and secure, she's born a Moabite. She marries this guy. She ends up following her commitment. She's like, I'm going with you, Naomi. Naomi shows up back home in Bethlehem. She's like, I'm, call me Mara, I'm bitter. It's funny because like, if anyone had the right to be bitter, it would be Ruth, but Ruth is not bitter. Ruth is, she's faithful and she's kind. And the whole entire story of Ruth, you discover that Ruth ends up just being in the right place at the right time. She ends up marrying this guy named Boaz, which is a whole nother sermon for everybody. Get you a Boaz, but (laughs) kinsman redeemer. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. But the entire story, well, the whole turnaround is not because of Naomi. The whole turnaround is because of the faithfulness of Ruth. That Ruth somewhere in her heart, although her husband had died, although she was taken from her land, she trusted God and she allowed forgiveness to resonate inside of her. I wanna say it this way today. Bitterness, friends, is ugly, but forgiveness is beautiful. Forgiveness is beautiful. And how do I deal with the heartache and the heartbreak? It is this word called forgiveness. This is where healing begins to happen. Forgiveness is not the denial that something happened to you. Forgiveness is not the denial that your dad was terrible, that your dad was tough, or that your dad wasn't there. You're not, you're not putting that under the rug. No, you are acknowledging that and you are confronting that, but then you are making a decision to say, in spite of all of those things, I'm not going to live bitter. I'm going to release that person who has hurt me, who has brought pain, not because they are worthy of it, but because I deserve to receive the grace that God has given me and I want to walk into a bright future and I can't get there with resentment holding me back. I know you're offended and maybe you're justified in your offense. 
man, do you wanna be healed or you wanna be justified? Forgiveness is showing grace and giving grace. And when I step into forgiveness, it releases me. It brings the healing to me. Exodus chapter 15 is an Old Testament story. And I know I'm giving you a lot today, a lot of things you can write down and go back and look at, but it just so sticks out at me because I had never seen it before. It's not in the book, but it just caught my attention. Exodus 15, verse 22, the Israelites have just left Egypt. They have just gone through the Red Sea, maybe one of the greatest miracles the Bible records. God is for you. God is working in your life. And as Moses led the Israel from the Red Sea and they went into the desert of Shur, for three days they traveled in the desert without finding water, looking for water. But when they finally came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was it was bitter. That is why, watch this, the place is called Mara. It's amazing. Before we get to the story of Ruth, there's the story in Exodus. They get to this place and the water is bitter. And that place is called Mara. And from that moment on, anything bitter is just called Mara. So the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? And then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. Another translation says a log. And he threw the log into the water and the water became sweet. Say, so Rich, what's the point of that story? The point of that story is to give you a foreshadow. The point of that story is to create an outline and to create a trace. That when my season of life is bitter, when what I'm drinking or tasting or coming up against seems to be bitter. What I need to do is I need to remind myself that 2000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this earth. And what did he do? He put a log on his back. He carried a piece of wood to Calvary's hill. And he was crucified on a tree. And when I add the cross to the equation, that which used to be bitter, now becomes sweet. How do you forgive? You don't forgive in your own strength. You forgive through the lens of grace. You forgive through the lens of what God did for you. How can you actually live offended and insecure and angry and resentful and bitter if you actually know what Jesus did for you? He came to jump into your bitterness and make it sweet. I close this way. I was this week in Montana uh, preaching for a good friend of mine, Levi Lusco, who pastors Fresh Life Church. In fact, today, right now, uh, I'm preaching somehow at Fresh Life Church, but I'm here. Um, thank God for the power of technology. And some of you know Levi. He, he came and preached at our church um, a couple different times and just an incredible Bible teacher, one of my favorite Bible teachers on the planet today. Just a couple years older than me. But a few years ago, he had a tragic thing take place in his life. Some of you know the story, but uh, his daughter, Lenya, who was five years old at the time, had an asthma attack and he went to her in her asthma attack and she actually died in his arms. This is a man of God, this is a pastor, this is a preacher, this is someone who's poured his life out for the gospel to build the church, to help people. And um, I was talking just this week with, with, with Levi, it's been, a few years now since she passed away. And I just said, I said, Levi, were you, were you angry in that time period? He said, oh, I was really angry, Rich. I was really angry. He said, I used, to, I used to leave my house and do walks and just scream and cry and shout. And I was angry. I said, Levi, were you angry? Were you angry at God? He said, Rich, I was never angry at God. So that I discovered quickly that I was angry with God. Because I had a revelation that this pain and this death and this trauma and this hurt, God didn't cause this. This sinful, broken world, God didn't plan this and design this and develop this. This has happened because of man. And God, well, he's the hero of the story. 
because he sent Jesus in the form of a baby and he threw a log into the bitter water and said, I've got something that will make it sweet again. You don't have to be angry at God. You can understand today that whatever you are going through, your heartache and your heartbreak, that God is angry with you. God has a solution for you, but you gotta put your trust and your hope in Him. He wants to heal you. He wants to welcome you home. He's not, he's not looking at you today, judging you. He's saying, I'm, I'm angry at the same thing that's hurting you and I have a solution. I have a solution. I wanna bring healing to you today. I wanna bring healing to your heartache and your heartbreak because if you don't address this, I don't care how perfect your spouse is. I don't care how big the house is that you build. I don't care how much money is at the bottom of that balance sheet. I don't care what school you get into. I don't care if all of your kids are on the honor roll and make the Dean's list. Your bitterness will rob you of the blessing of God. Today, let God bring healing to your situation. Do you believe that? Come on, all over this place. Can we just give God some praise? Come on, why don't you stand to your feet? Hey, this is Rich and Don Sheree Wilkerson, and we want to say thank you so much for watching and engaging with today's content. Maybe today you want to make the decision to follow Jesus. Why don't you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, today I choose to entrust my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me a new creation. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're celebrating with you the decision that you've made, and we want to walk this journey out alongside you. Yeah, and if you just prayed that prayer, why don't you go ahead and follow the prompts that are on the screen right now? We're so glad that you took some time to watch today's message. Do us a favor. If it encouraged you, if it impacted you, go ahead and share this. And if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the Voo Church YouTube channel so you can continue to get more content like this. We love you guys, and we're declaring the best is yet to come. come.